I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. That's what we're talking about is putting dredged and fill material like dirt in wetlands so they're no longer wetlands or part of them aren't or changing them a lot. Hi and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court and it has been a busy and important week again at the highest court in the land. We've been covering it like mad things in all sorts of extra episodes in our Opinion Palooza initiative here at Slate. You can go to slate.com slash opinion palooza to make sure you're all caught up. But with the court headed into Juneteenth weekend, with 18 cases left to go, I can pretty much promise that the next two weeks are going to be all kinds of mayhem. This past Friday, the court handed down two decisions with Justices Samuel Alito and Neil Gorsuch skipping the session altogether. I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that my friend Mark Joseph Stern's, quote, soft pants theory of why it is that the justices just don't like to go in and read opinions really is fully operative, even in these last weeks of June. Looks like the next day for decisions will be Thursday, so do stay tuned. And in the meantime, today felt like a really good day to cover one of the cases we blew past on the show. Uh, While the Voting Rights Act case netted out to no big change to Section 2 of the VRA, and while the Indian Child Welfare Act case that came down this week also makes no huge difference other than not doing something awful, The Sackett case that was decided two weeks ago actually made very consequential changes to how the Clean Water Act will work and be enforced. We're going to talk about that on today's show. Later on in the show, Slate Plus members are going to get to hear Mark Stern and I as we attempt to answer some of the letters you've been stuffing into our mailbox. If you are not a Slate Plus member, but you'd like to access bonus content like my conversations with Mark or unlimited reading at Slate.com, and if you'd like to enjoy all of Slate's podcasts ad-free, go to slate.com slash amicus plus to find out more and keep sending your letters in and we will keep trying to read them in our bonus segments. But first, last month saw a unanimous ruling in Sackett versus EPA, and we just haven't had time to think it out on this show. So this week, as part of our commitment to trying to do better on covering environmental issues on the show, we're bringing in some big guns to explain why it is that Sackett may well prove to be the most consequential water case of a generation. And to do that, we called on my old friend, Sean Donahue of Donahue and Goldberg LLP, whose practice is focused on appellate litigation, including environmental cases in federal and state appellate courts. Sean spent four years at the DOJ's Environmental and Natural Resources Division appellate section, briefing and arguing cases in the U.S. Courts of Appeals and state Supreme Courts concerning federal environmental and natural resources law. He also clerked for a Bader Ginsburg, and for Justice John Paul Stevens. He's argued about 50 cases in federal and state appellate courts. And Sean also squarely fits into my ridiculously oversimplified clerk's worldview that holds that the Justice Stevens clerks are always the nicest ones who would give you a kidney if you really needed one. So Sean, welcome to Amicus. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I think what I want to start with is the Clean Water Act, if you would, because probably a lot of listeners haven't known a time before the Clean Water Act, but there it has been since 1972, attempting to clean the waters of the United States. So I wonder if you could just start maybe by telling us what the world was like before the Clean Water Act and what it purported to do. 
Yeah. So before the Clean Water Act, water quality was regarded as a responsibility of state and local government primarily, and the federal government did not attempt to assert in a muscular way. There were some areas, the Rivers and Harbors Act, which was originally about preventing obstructions of commerce, uh, but it had been used against pollution in a meaningful way, but it was very limited. And the Clean Water Act, like some of the other big Clean Air Act, CERCLA, Endangered Species Act was an effort to sort of comprehensively respond to what was regarded as a sorely deficient effort at the state and local government to protect environmental quality. And there was a sense that state law just wasn't getting it done. The famous examples of the burning river in Cleveland, it's clearly the case that water quality was a big problem in much of the country. And the idea of swimming or fishing in a lot of both salt and fresh waters in the country was just out of the question. Water was being used as a a dump. And so this was an effort to not just kind of mitigate the problem, but comprehensively take it in hand by requiring a permit for any discharge of pollutant into what the statute called the waters of the United States. But from the beginning, there was this kind of dual conception of what Congress was covering. The statute uses the term navigable waters, which sounds more like rivers and harbors and uh, making sure that commerce can proceed. But then there's this broad but ambiguous term, waters of the United States. And then there's a sort of statement of what the purpose of all this is, and that's to restore the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the waters of the United States. And And that's a sort of ecological objective. And it was understood that this was going to require a lot of work. And there's federal state partnership in this statute, as with the others. But the level of ambition is very high. And of course, in a lot of ways, as even the majority opinion in the SACA case notes, uh, has been quite successful. And we know the Potomac River, the Charles River, the Hudson River, which were all pretty nasty, are dramatically cleaner, albeit not perfect. So very successful in a lot of respects. In some other key respects, I think folks would say even before this decision, not fully successful, especially sort of runoff type non-point source pollution and the, the like massive dead spot in the Gulf of Mexico that you've read about. There are some areas where it hasn't been fully successful, but generally one of the brightest stars in the firmament of federal environmental law. And correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I remember we talked to Professor Richard Lazarus about some of this last year, and it seems to me that for at least the first few decades of the Clean Water Act and other sort of regulations that purported to do some of this environmental work, the presumption was these were meant to be read pretty broadly, right? That they were meant to be, uh, and the courts, I think, affirmed that you know, err on the side of assuming that these agencies know what they're doing and that they have to do what they're doing in order to get it done. And it feels like I'm going to say a fork in the road, but I want to say a bend in the river comes in 2006 in Rapanos versus United States, where suddenly we have sort of, as you say, two next to each other side by side readings of what this WOTUS, Waters of the United States, might mean. Can you talk us through the two visions? Yeah. In the Rapanos decision, and this series of cases, including Sackett, involve wetlands, which involve a lot of different kinds of ecosystems, but they tend to be what we think of as kind of swamps, areas that are wet a lot of the time and have wetland type vegetation in them. And they turn out to be, as I think everybody knows by now, incredibly important ecologically, not just for distinctive creatures that live in them, but also in cleaning the water and filtering out pollutants, in mitigating flooding and the intrusion of salt water into fresh water and kind of buffering some of these and slowing the effects of sea level rise. And so they are super important, but because they have this sort of dual land water nature, there's been a tremendous amount of debate, some of which has gotten to the Supreme Court about to what extent should they be regulated as waters or to protect waters. And there's a series of cases in which the court struggled with this and sort of there was agreement that 
traditional navigable waters are sort of the heartland and protecting the integrity of the Mississippi River's water, everybody agrees, is appropriately within the scope of the act. Um, But then what about wetlands that are ecologically connected, such that if you put pollutants in them, or if they were to disappear, it would affect the Mississippi's waters, but that are also don't look like a river at all. And in a series of cases, the court has tried to answer this. The statute happens to be jointly administered by EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers, and they've struggled with this. Uh, But in a series of cases, the court seemed to come up with a few ground rules. The Rapanos decision was a case where the court fractured And there was an opinion by Justice Stevens that kind of took a relatively broad view that allowed EPA and the court to regulate wetlands when they're deemed ecologically significant and didn't struggle with that as being within the statute and regarded the statute's purpose of protecting the integrity of waters as definitely informing the scope of jurisdiction. And then you had an important separate opinion by Justice Scalia not a majority opinion, a plurality opinion that said, you know, we got to be guided by the statute. And the statute is not just written in terms of ecological importance. And the statute still says navigable. And it's crazy to define something that looks like land or has the nature of land as water. And so we, the court, think that the proper test should be wetlands are only covered when there's a continuous surface water connection. So there's not something like a berm or a a bank of land between the wetland and the traditionally navigable water. And we just find that distinction in the statute. But there's also talk about, you know, if we didn't read it that way, there'd be too much power on behalf of the agencies to regulate resources that otherwise be subject to state and local regulation or no regulation to, you know, private choice. So that's uh, regarded as a pretty extreme view, and it's it's not the law. Then there's also a concurring opinion by Justice Kennedy that takes a kind of middle of the road view characteristically and comes up with articulates something that he calls the significant nexus requirement, which is you can regulate wetlands that are near navigable waters if there's a significant nexus, which is mainly a test about ecological impacts. If we know that this particular wetland is critical for the water quality or for fish or some other indicium of the biological health of the navigable water, then the agencies can regulate it. But it's a bit of a resource by resource, factually intensive. The agencies sort of have to prove up why on the basis of sort of scientific concerns, particular wetlands should be regulated. And that ends up, even though it's only a one justice opinion, it, it ends up making a sort of conception of what a majority of the court thinks is at a minimum covered, Justice Kennedy plus the Stevens group. And that's what the agencies sort of are guided by for a long time. There were, and I should note another really important opinion in Rapanos, and that is the chief justice who writes the core and EPA have significant discretion to define sort of what the limits of their reach under the Clean Water Act is, and they have failed to exercise it by using rulemaking. And if they'd done that, we wouldn't be here struggling as judges with what to do and sort of criticizing them for not using notice and comment rulemaking and that sort of formal agency policymaking. And the agencies take the hints from the court, right? Uh, In a way, the system works as intended. Years later, we can skip. There was an Obama administration rule. Then there was a Trump rule that rolled it back and replaced it with what was widely regarded as a much less protective rule. There was a massive amount of litigation over that that was never ultimately resolved. And then the Biden administration, while this Sackett case was actually in the Supreme Court, finalized a rule that was basically built on the Kennedy test and was very much designed to try to appease the court and say, we're not going as far as we could go. We're basing this on Justice Kennedy's kind of middle of the road, common sense approach. We're going to prove when wetlands are particularly important and we're going to regulate only those. And there was hope that the combination of a moderate rule and having done what the chief had said should be done, use rulemaking, 
might get the court to not go off on its own in a destructive course. And that didn't work, as this case uh, shows. We're going to take a quick break. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Hey there, Amicus listeners. If you like this show, you should really check out The Waves from Slate. The world can feel overwhelming right now. Everyone is always yelling, there's too much TV to find anything good, and who knows what is going to happen with the climate. Luckily, there's The Waves. Every episode, you get a deep dive into a topic we can't stop thinking about. From what the E. Jean Carroll victory means for women, to protecting kids from diet culture, to making movies horny again. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it and unpacking what gender has to do with it. Listen to The Waves from Slate, wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to my conversation with Sean Donahue about Sackett v. EPA, the Waters of the United States case that kicked off Opinion Palooza a couple weeks back, but really deserves more focused attention. Do you want to just give us three minutes on the facts of this particular case, which has Michael and Chantel Sackett, who ran an excavation company and they want to develop property a few hundred feet from Priest Lake in the Idaho panhandle? And and, and uh, this case has been like pinging around the federal courts for like, what, 14 years? I mean, the Sacketts really, really uh, want to do this digging. Yeah. I mean, it's a good example of the kind of, and it's not at all limited to environmental litigation, but of a kind of case that becomes a rallying cry for sort of a movement and a set of arguments that this is an area where the federal government is overreaching and jerking around ordinary citizens who just want to do what we all want to do, have a nice property near a lake and do their thing. There are real problems with the story. As an example of overreach, this is a property they acquired knowing that there was a good possibility that there was sort of legally protected wetland that was sort of around the purchase transaction. They were pretty aggressive in terms of the facts. And one of the things that's a little disappointing about this decision beside the bottom line is that even the dissenters said, oh, we agree that the Sackett's property is not covered. I think that may have had something to do with sort of internal court efforts to cobble together. I mean, this case could have gone the other way. It was five to four on what mattered on the test. And you can imagine that there was an effort perhaps involving Justice Kagan to kind of peel off one more justice. Maybe Justice Barrett would have been the most likely. And maybe that involved not trying to get this case to come out differently, but to establish a rule that would be more acceptable. But yeah, because this this case is it's hardly an example of an absurdly aggressive reading. This is, as you mentioned, right near this lake that almost everybody, with the possible exception of Justice Thomas, agrees is navigable under the most restrictive definitions. And the area on the Sackett's land is separated from a wetland by just a road. And I don't think there was any debate that as a matter of ecology, the Sackett's property would affect both the other wetland and the lake itself. So this is one that if you used a significant nexus type science-based test, you probably get coverage. And so it's a little disappointing for the, none of the opinion sort of struggles with that. They just kind of move on. But that's partly because given where the majority wanted to go, This was obviously about what's the rule going to be for the rest of the country. And to be clear, this isn't the first time the Sackett's case goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, right? Uh, Yeah. And the the Sackett's case actually is the second time it came to the Supreme Court. The first time it was over whether the Sackett's could challenge an EPA administrative order sort of provisionally finding that their property was subject to the permitting requirement, which EPA had said, no, you can only challenge that. Later, if there's an enforcement action or a fine against you, 
And the court rejected that and said, no, people can challenge it. And I will say there's been concern, as I mentioned, about this permitting program. I mean, a lot of environmental laws operate more on big companies and sometimes on uh, state and local governments. But the Clean Water Act, maybe more than Clean Air Act and some of the others, sort of does operate on individuals. And I think the court has been very concerned about overreach, I think. Some of that may be legitimate, but an awful lot of it is well-run, coordinated campaigns to sort of emphasize this. And it unfortunately, those campaigns tend to be very successful and well-funded. And we sometimes forget that things like protecting water quality are inherently hard and they involve putting some burdens on all of us because it's a problem with, you know, a thousand sources you get a contaminated and biologically stressed, you know, Chesapeake Bay, if you don't regulate what happens on the thousands of pieces of land whose runoff affects the bay. And that's just a hard thing. And you see in the majority opinion here, very much buying the narrative that this is just too much burden on landowners and there's lots of delay and cost and potentially ruinous fines. And that kind of dominates. And one of the criticisms one could make about Justice Alito's opinion here is he recites all that stuff that was sort of in the in the litany of conservative critique of the wetlands program. And that obviously informs the interpretation of the decision to impose a narrow interpretation as a matter of immutable judicial interpretation. But then late in the opinion where he's discussing EPA and the Corps' arguments for their broader interpretation, he rejects concerns about water quality as sort of policy concerns that shouldn't affect our hard-nosed reading of the law. And of course, this is a law that begins with talking about the purpose of protecting the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our waters. And it would seem quite legitimate to consider those congressionally legislated purposes in construing the statute. And that's like a big thing. And I don't want to get ahead of us, but one of the surprising aspects of this decision is Justice Kavanaugh writes sort of the main dissent. And he points out that the effect of this decision is to remove federal protection for a vast amount of land, uh, acreage um, in the country with very significant adverse impacts to be expected. So this decision, I think you could say in terms of its immediate impact is maybe the most destructive, most harmful. I mean, the last year's West Virginia decision, you know, was about a rule that wasn't in effect and it was a little bit theoretical and we will see how they will apply that, um, the sort of major questions doctrine, certainly very significant, but this rule sort of immediately and dramatically shrinks the protection of federal environmental law in a way that overrides eight presidential administrations going all the way back to Ronald Reagan's administration. So it's pretty extreme to quote Justice Scalia, this wolf comes as a wolf. This is a big deal, very unfortunate. I guess maybe the silver lining or the the possibility is that this is a statutory construction decision. I think it's gonna be a big problem And it's something that folks who really care about water quality can push Congress to fix. That may sound laughable right now, but it's not out of the question that with some work, probably with some pretty dramatic, unfortunate examples of what can happen if you don't step up to protect water quality. I'm hopeful that we'll get that fixed before too long. So I want to tug on a couple of different threads that you've laid out for us. One is this feels like we could put it into that category of cases where I think you said this so powerfully. It's really easy to say, you know, we have like poor mom and pop landowners just trying to improve their property the way God intended on the one side and just nameless, faceless bureaucrats 
who, you know, are not doing anything other than getting in their way. And, and, and we've heard that story told time and again in recent years. It's kind of a way of constructing the narrative so that only one side's interests look sympathetic. And as you say, you know, aggregated across millions of people, there is uh, an interest in protecting the water, but it's just never going to make for a good Netflix film. And I think that's one of the things you're saying. And I think... The other thing that you're saying that's that's pretty important is there's a theme here that sort of says we know a lot more about science, about wetlands, about how water works and how pollution happens than we did in 1972. And yet there's this weird, I mean, I'm thinking that this echoes in Dobbs too, you know, the world has changed substantially in 50 years. And yet the opinion kind of not only freezes the law at the moment that it's drafted, but it actually doesn't care that we know more. It's actually irrelevant that science has moved on. I think that's right. Although I, w- I want to just maybe register a little note. I wouldn't acknowledge that what the court was reacting to here, or I wouldn't agree, was was kind of an effort to expand the scope of wetlands protection just in response to science and to stretch an old law. Because I think in this case, and I think the Kavanaugh opinion kind of makes this well, there was actually in the enacted text, there was a pretty compelling argument. And that this is the whole adjacent wetlands that the term adjacent in the statute made clear that Congress recognized that some wetlands count as waters of the United States. And that's what Justice Kavanaugh's dissent is all about, that as a matter of plain language, these wetlands that are near waters of the United States are covered. And certainly the Corps and EPA can decide to take a subset of those nearby wetlands and define them as the ones that are really important for protecting navigable waters, our lakes, our oceans, rivers, et cetera. That's a big objection. There's another, the idea that textualism is not self-defining and textualism too can be used in ways that are disputed and sometimes seem opportunistic or inconsistent. I mean, here the textualist case for the government's position was very strong because adjacent, as Justice Kavanaugh pointed out, doesn't mean immediately touching. It doesn't mean continuously connected at the surface. It means nearby. And that can include wetlands that are separated from navigable waters by, you know, a berm, a narrow pile of dirt. The majority responds to that argument, but I don't think it ever has a good argument for just the dictionary definition. You also have this enormously consistent, long history of administrations of both parties agreeing that adjacent wetlands were included. So so this is a decision that I think is arguably and pretty plausibly just a revision of the statute. And that's very unfortunate. Obviously, statutory construction is hard. Sometimes one can think the court got it wrong. But this one, there was just so much history that was thrown out. But Congress can fix it if people insist that it does. And the state level, states can regulate more broadly and can regulate all wetlands. That happens in some places. It will certainly happen more after this in some states. And in other states, it it won't. I just want to give you one chance to, I think you've largely done it. I think the sort of knock on Justice Alito's majority opinion was A, bad textualism, i.e. he rewrote the statute, B, that he sort of arrogated to himself. I think Justice Kagan, in her dissent, accuses the majority of appointing itself, quote, as the national decision maker on environmental policy. And I think that there's a sort of a two-step there that I wondered if you would unpack. It's not just bad textualism. It's bad textualism plus we know something nobody else knows, right? Yeah. So what Justice Kagan points to in part is this reliance on clear statement rules. The court denigrates the significant nexus test as not being in the statute. So why would we do that? It's not as if the court doesn't sometimes put together tests in interpreting statutes that aren't themselves in the statute. That's very common. But anyway, 
But of course, the continuous surface water connection such that it's difficult to tell where the water ends and the land begins or, or vice versa, that's not in the statute either, right? The court's test. So just one of the many ways. But the court ultimately doesn't suggest that the plain language alone answers the question in its favor. What it does is it kind of says, well, this case implicates two different clear statement rules, which are just rules where the court says for some sort of background constitutional or other reason, we're going to require an unusual degree of clarity before a legislature can do something or other. And the majority applies two different ones here. One is a clear statement rule requiring that statutes speak especially clearly when Congress is doing something that would implicate state and local traditional powers. And uh, the term private property is also in there. But I think I think they're just talking about regulatory powers over police powers and so forth. And then the other one is because there are criminal penalties under the Clean Air Act, we will not allow Congress to legislate in a way that's vague. And it's the scope of jurisdiction is under significant nexus under the government's test is too vague. And so we're going to impose something clearer, although a test that says it's difficult to tell where land ends and water begins or or whatever is not necessarily so clear either. Um, But those sort of judicially imposed rules end up cutting through the noise of the difficult back and forth about what the statute means and just saying, no, because this is hard, the challengers win. Because there's a lack of clarity, that means that the agency has to lose. And that looks like what the court did in West Virginia a little bit applied a different sort of clear statement rule, but saying, you know, EPA doesn't have this power because it's an unusually big power because Congress didn't spell it out. And that's the problem with these kinds of rules, which are not new. The problem with using them this aggressively is that they're manipulable. One could imagine coming up with a rule that says an interpretation that will severely undermine the express policy of a statute should be disfavored. Courts sometimes say things like that. And why wouldn't that have as much power as the one the court uh, applied here? So so that's, I think, Justice Kagan saying these are manipulable, clear statement rules the court kind of makes up or expands, and then put the court in the driver's seat. And I think that really is when you're dealing with something this science-laden, ecology-laden, geography-laden, it's really important to remember that there are these experts out there that we all pay for who are really know a lot and have a lot of experience and to respect their work a little more than this uh, majority opinion seems to. Time now for a quick break. Hi there, it's David Plotz, co-host of Slate's Political Gab Fest podcast, and I am really excited to announce that we're doing a live show on Wednesday, June 28th. Please join me, Emily Bazelon, and John Dickerson at 6th and I in Washington, D.C. for an incredible night of political discussion, debate, and fun. Slate Plus members, you get an exclusive discount, so if you're not a Slate Plus member, this is a great time to join. Go to slate.com slash gabfestlive right now to get your tickets. They are first come, first served. Again, that's slate.com slash GabFestLive for more information and to buy your tickets for our June 28th live show in Washington, D.C. at 6th and I. We'll be streaming, too, so if you can't make it in person that night, fear not, you can join our virtual gathering instead. Slate.com slash GabFestLive. The hearing will come to order. Good morning, Judge. Welcome to the blinding lights. Out now from Slate Podcast. Members of this committee have asked, who is the real Clarence Thomas? What is the real Clarence Thomas? Which is the real Clarence Thomas? Justice Thomas was a radical. He's this almost like Shakespearean figure. A black man who was a conservative. Closely aligned with Malcolm X and the most liberal of ideology. And that is a puzzle. I don't know that I would call myself an enigma. I'm just Clarence Thomas. So look, when I talk about Clarence Thomas, there are going to be two groups of listeners, and neither one are going to like what I say. So my question to you is, why am I doing this interview? Slow Burn Season 8, Becoming Justice Thomas, hosted by me, Joel Anderson, is out now, wherever you listen. 
Now, a little bit of housekeeping. You hopefully know by now that Amicus is coming to you weekly throughout the month of June. We are also releasing emergency bonus episodes as major decisions come down from the high court. Opinion Palooza is part of our work to try to define a new approach to how the media covers the Supreme Court. Check it out at slate.com slash opinion palooza. And a vital part of Slate's coverage includes Slow Burn becoming Clarence Thomas, hosted by Joel Anderson. As we accumulate more dissents and await some very consequential decisions, some of which will be penned by Justice Thomas, this season of Slow Burn provides an essential kind of making of look at the justice and his path from youthful radical to conservative icon. So do be sure to check that out. Slow Burn Season 8, Becoming Justice Thomas, wherever you listen to your podcasts. More now with environmental appellate lawyer Sean Donahue on the fallout and maybe the cures from the Supreme Court's decision last month in Sackett v. EPA. Sean, I know you want to get to things we can do to send people out with a smile on their faces. But before we do that, you began to unpack the implications. And you said, I'm going to paraphrase, holy crap, this is pretty bad, uh, even as compared to last year's EPA case. Um, I'm just looking at Sam Sankar's quote that this undoes a half century of progress, almost 90 million acres of formerly protected wetlands now face an existential threat from polluters and developers. Can you just help us understand for those of us who don't see the world as you do, what the implications are, what it's going to look like? Like, how does this, I, I keep reading, this is super bad, but I I just don't know what that means. None of us knows for sure how this is going to play out, but it is the case that all of a sudden vast, um, you know, I've seen numbers as high as 50%. I don't know that that's the case. And I think there is some unknowns about how many wetlands will meet this continuous surface water connection test. And, And what does relatively continuous, which is the phrase mean how much of the year does something have to be dry? What, what about if it's a drought? And then it's like, so there's all kinds of stuff. So th- this will not even succeed in ending disputatious litigation over wetlands. But it's clearly the case that a lot of wetlands that required a permit, which meant an analysis of what the impact of filling the wetland would be. That's what we're talking about is putting dredged and filled material like dirt in wetlands. So they're no longer wetlands or part of them aren't or changing them a lot. So there'd be an analysis. And then the agencies might say no, if it's really bad, or they might, as a much more common, impose some conditions to mitigate the impacts. And in some states, there will be a state agency that will do that, might have done that anyway, Maybe there won't be a a huge difference in outcomes. Maybe some states will ramp up their protections, Uh, but there will be a lot of states where this sort of limitation on private property owners' ability to do what they wish was never popular. They were among the states participating in filing amicus briefs in this case. And one would expect that in those states, there will just be less protection. There will be Projects that wouldn't have been allowed will be allowed, and projects that would have been subject to mitigating conditions will not. Will there be a pushback? And when is, I think that's a question that we haven't resolved yet, but I think environmental groups and people who care about these things are right to be really concerned and to be realizing that this is going to need to be a subject of a lot of work because it's not the end of the story. It's, it's, uh, conclusion that the 1972 Clean Water Act and subsequent amendments don't cover a lot of the resources that we thought they did and that the Reagan administration thought they did and the W. Bush administration. Um, And so that's that's definitely a big issue. So now I want to give you a chance to tell us stuff we can do. And you started to say, and I think this is really important, There was something about last year's EPA case that was kind of paralyzing because it was a constitutional, you know, was this major questions doctrine? What's a major question? Nobody knows. How do you work around it? Nobody's quite sure. This feels like, as you say, it's a statutory problem. You can fix it. As somebody who thinks about moving forward, 
is in your toolbox when you think about litigating not just Clean Water Act cases, but environmental cases generally, when you know that you have a court that's not super psyched about the work you're doing, what is still available to us? And then I'm going to ask the obvious follow on, which is people who feel as I do that these questions are too huge and intractable to wrap our heads around often don't know what it is that they can do. So I'm going to ask you, having told me what's in your toolbox, to tell me what to put into mine. Sure. A sweeping question. But I think one thing to remember is this decision is really unfortunate. I think West Virginia was unfortunate the court got involved at all. It was not necessary. But how it plays out, we'll see. Um, But we still have this like really admirable system for protecting resources. It's inadequate in a lot of ways, but it's still there. And it's not like this decision alone, like knocks everything down. And and there will be efforts to build on this and cut further. And those should be resisted and people need to pay attention and call out these kinds of efforts. And I think there has been on the right, this very successful effort to denigrate the use of law, the use of administrative agencies to protect resources and public goods and a suggestion that it's nothing but interloping, you know, woke people who, you know, aren't providing any useful service and an attack on scientists as sort of inherently biased people. And I think all that is related and it's more than environmental law. And I think it needs to be resisted and called out at every local Board of Selectmen meeting and every state legislature and the value of these things, the value of scientific facts, whether it's vaccine denialism or in curious denialism of hydrology. It's a debate that is happening at so many levels. There's no one place. It's kind of everywhere. As far as things, I mean, I think, first of all, people shouldn't get disheartened. Like this stuff is just inherently hard. There's a back and forth and it's been the case for a long time. There'll be losses in general. But one thing that's unusual about Sackett, in general, the, the rule has been once sort of protections are in place, they tend to be hard to dislodge because they're popular. Before the 90s and, and Newt Gingrich, environmental protection had a significant bipartisan component. A lot of the great heroes and people responsible for a lot of the successes were Republicans. That's obviously changed a lot, but it needn't always be that way. Uh, But it's been really hard to roll back things. This is a rollback, this decision by judicial decision. And, you know, it is my hope that it'll get people's attention and kind of remind us that these things are ultimately decided by politics of some kind. And I would also note there's been some really big victories. I mean, on the climate, which is what I mostly do, air and climate, that's why I randomly insert Clean Air Act when I mean Clean Water Act. And there have been some really big victories legislatively. The Inflation Reduction Act, for example, was just this incredibly far-reaching, forceful endorsement of climate action and investment in climate action. And that is going to be playing out and changing our society toward clean energy and climate. And there's so many opportunities there. Um, So as far as what people can do, besides sort of keeping track of this stuff, which is sometimes can be depressing, it's also confusing, but I think picking an issue to work on and stay up on and write letters and make phone calls and people who are supporting these kinds of rollbacks should have to answer for them. Because I think clean water is just something It's just critical, obviously, to life and to good quality of life. And I think at some level, people would acknowledge that we have to do things and make some sacrifices. And I think sometimes in our sort of fractured national debate about things, we kind of lose touch. But I'm I'm hoping that maybe having a big blow like this will kind of create some focus. So that's some things. Also pleasant to go down to your local stream or river and pick up some trash or do something very local like that can feel good and be good. I had written down on my notepad, Sean, that as everybody launches themselves into the long weekend, maybe the real enemy is, quote, incurious denialism of hydrology. And I think maybe we make the t-shirts. I think Um, uh, it's a, it's a definite winner. I really, really want to thank you because I have to say, while I read all the 
coverage, I thought I couldn't quite get my head around what it was I was so anxious about. And I think the gift you've given us is told us that among all the things to be anxious about, there's a lot to be hopeful about. So Sean Donahue of Donahue and Goldberg LLP has a practice focused on appellate litigation, including environmental cases in federal and state appellate courts. Before that, He spent four years at the Justice Department's Environmental and Natural Resources Division appellate section, and he is, as is abundantly clear from this conversation, one of those painfully nice John Paul Stevens clerks that we keep talking about. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much, Talia. Pleasure. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for your letters and questions. You can keep in touch at amicus at slate.com, and you can always find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Birmingham. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate, and Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We will be back with another episode of Amicus next week. Until then, hang on in there. Thank you.